One of the words that God has, has placed on my, li- or on my heart this year is the word sift. And we started doing a series that we opened up three weeks ago. Today is the last message in that series. And, and basically the word sift means to separate, remove, go through, to be shaken. I'm going to have you turn on the projector on the back wall if you're in a sound booth. To separate, remove, to go through, or be shaken. And one of the things that that we've been talking about is how God will allow this to happen. And and if we're honest, we've seen that happening in our our world and in our community. And and even in our church, there's a a sift that is taking place. People are are being shaken. People are, are, there's a, a shaking that's taking place. And my prayer throughout all this is that we can remain faithful and and through our faithfulness we can be made stronger and through these stories that we've been looking at like Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego we've been learning about some individuals whose lives were shaken and yet they remained faithful in the ship in the sift and as a result of that God has blessed them last week we talked about being devoted to God starts by knowing who we are and what we stand for. Because that's where devotion actually starts. If you don't know who you are in Christ, it's it's really hard to stand. If you don't know where you're at in Christ, it's really hard to stand. And we learned last week that we're not called to be like the majority, but we are called and set apart. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that this morning. We're not called, we're set apart. And we're asked to take a stand for something rather than ourselves. And who we're supposed to take a stand for is Jesus Christ himself. Hey, being devoted to God starts by knowing who we are and and what we stand for. And that's really what separates us from the rest of the world. And part of our vision here at the Lighthouse Church is is we want to see people grow. We want to see people become mature believers. We want to be a church of disciples that is making disciples. We had an individual baptized last week, and this individual, uh, we're super excited. He came back a second week. We're doing something right I can't tell you how many times people get baptized and then the enemy takes a stand and then those people run. I'm thankful that this person didn't run. We want to be a church that stands with people who get baptized to encourage, to uplift, to pray, to intercede because we really believe that if we're going to change the community that we live in, then we have to be disciple-making believers. And so we want to raise up a, a generation of disciples and in order to do that, we have to understand who we are in Christ and, and what we believe. I want to ask that you bow your heads, and we're just going to pray as we continue our series. We're closing it out with a very familiar story, Daniel and the lion's den. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word that doesn't return void. I thank you for the desire that you've placed in our heart to make disciples. Lord, I thank you that it starts with us being a disciple. So I pray that as we share this story today, a very powerful story of an individual who didn't always have it easy, that it resonates within each of us, and that we leave here encouraged, equipped, filled with Holy Spirit, to go out and make disciples. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Daniel chapter six. If you're following along in version, I want to give you a chance to open that app up, all of our scriptures in there. If you brought a, a hardcore copy of the Bible, I want to give you a chance to open it up. Uh, so that you can follow along with us. And while you're doing this, I I just want to just do a quick recap. If you remember correctly, Daniel was taken into captivity around the age of of 15. 
He was taken from his home. He was told what he could eat and what he could drink. He was taught a new language. He was named after a, a pagan god. And over the course of his lifetime, was forced to serve multiple kings. And yet, in all of this, Daniel did something that really is unheard of. He remained loyal. He remained loyal to the king, and he remained faithful to the king. He remained loyal to the kings that he served, but he remained faithful to God, our creator. And, and, and in this story that we're coming to, what many of you might not recognize is, is that this period of time, Daniel is actually an old man. He is in his, his 80s, maybe 82, 85-ish. Anybody 80 or above in here with us today? So it would be almost like throwing our sweet dear Grandma Velma <laughs> in with a mean old bunch of lions. Who does that? That's the story that, that we're going to, to read Today, Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two other administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than any other administrator and high officers. And because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Now this isn't Daniel's first go around, and this isn't the first king that Daniel served. In fact, when we introduce this story, he was serving under King Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar had made this golden image, and he said, hey, you all are going to bow down, and if you don't bow down and worship me, then I'm going to put you in the fiery furnace, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused. They said, hey, we will not bow, and they were thrown into this furnace only to find out that there was somebody in the furnace with them who I believe and am convinced with all of my heart that it was Jesus in the furnace with him. So when you're going through some stuff and when you feel like you're all alone, I want you to hear this. You are not. Jesus is with you. And after they came out of that furnace, Nebuchadnezzar was so excited. He says, he is the true God. Only to later go back to his old self only to later be removed from the kingdom because once again he got caught up with self. And then his son took over. And then his son was killed. And here we are again with a, another king. However, Daniel, Daniel remained faithful to God. Daniel was loyal to the king's whom he served. In other words, Daniel's devotion to God is really what set him apart. Daniel's reputation set him apart. Daniel's interpretation, one of the things that Daniel had the gift was the gift of interpretation, and he did this for king after king after king. Daniel's in integrity, Daniel's loyalty, these are the things that set Daniel apart, and, and I know what some of you are thinking. You might not know this, but if you are a follower of Jesus, you too have been set apart. I know you might not think that, and you might not put yourself up there with Daniel, but if you're truly following Jesus, it's important that you hear this. You have been set apart. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2 says this, You've been set apart as holy to the Lord your God. And he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to his own special treasure. Some of you are saying, Pastor, that's Old Testament. Some of you are saying, Pastor, that was written to the, the nation of Israel. That's true, but you and I are adopted into 
You have to understand the whole context in which scripture is written. You have to understand that, that we have been adopted into, which means now this verse applies to us Gentiles. In fact, Peter goes on to echo this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he says, you are a holy nation, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging to, to God. If you're a believer, you have been set apart. You have been set apart. If you're a believer, you've been set apart. And, and the second point I want to make to this morning is this. A life lived for God does not go unnoticed. You might not think anyone notices, but they do. You might not think anyone's watching, but they are. They see the life that you live. They see the God that you follow. And if no one else did notice, can I say this, the Lord does notice? You have been set apart. I love what Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 says. It says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on the hilltop that cannot be hidden no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise who? Your heavenly Father. You. Everyone say, that's me. You. That, that's me. You are the light of the world. Your life, the way that you live, matters. It matters to Christ. One of the visions that we've had here from day one is, is we want to be a church that shines the light, that people see something different about us. The reason that we have a lighthouse on the front of this building is a reminder for every time that we join together that there's something different about us us that we are a light that is shining that because of Christ living and dwelling inside of us that we're to shine that light that not only do we shine the light we proclaim God's word and in order to proclaim his word you have to know his word and through the word this world is changed and I'm just going to be honest this morning we're doing a great job. I want to lift you up this morning. I see so many people in our church who have grown so much. And I just want to say thank you for being a follower of Jesus. I just want to say thank you for growing in your relationship with Christ. I am thankful and blessed and honored to pastor a church where people are growing and maturing. And if you're not there yet, I just want to say this. We're not giving up on you because God's not giving up on you. We are here. Reach out to us. We want to help you mature and grow. Verse 4. Then the other administrators and the high officers began searching for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling the government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn him by. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Which brings me to our next point. When God raises you up, when God raises you up, others will try to tear you down. You know this, right? Right? When God raises you up, others will, will try to, to tear you down. You know what I'm talking. People talking about you, people trying to make themselves better by, by bringing you down. We see this. We even see this in, inside churches, which should never happen, but, but we know that it happens. When God raises you up, others will do their best to, to bring you down, which is exactly what they were trying to do to Daniel. 
Daniel had been elevated. God had blessed Daniel. And it hadn't been easy. I would not want to trade shoes with Daniel. Daniel had been through some stuff that we've not been through. And I don't know about you, but when that happens, it hurts. Right? When people you love, people whom you trust, people whom God has placed in your life now are trying to bring you down and and attack your very integrity, it it hurts. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I met with an individual who wanted to bring some things to my attention. And they said, Pastor, you just need to know this. There's, There's some people in your church who are saying some negative things about you. Now, the person that came to me does not attend our church. Okay, the person who came to me said, you know, I just think you need to be aware of this because if somebody was talking about me, I would want to know. These are people who who have been coming to your church for quite some time and they're saying some stuff and so I'm just gonna share this. I'm not gonna call anybody out. You know who you are and if you've talked about me or any other leader, then that's between you and God. But this person had some problems with with the way that we just do things here at the church. Said that we're always trying to quench the spirit. Said that we don't give people the right to speak freely and openly in tongues. And and then became very critical of the way that we try to reach people. And, And I'm used to that somewhat because if you're serving in leadership, people will be critical of you. But when it's people whom you love, people whom know you, people who you've built relationships with, it, it hurts. I don't care who you are, it, it hurts. And in a small town, if you don't know anything, it always comes back to you. You know that, right? You, you've heard that. When God raises you up, and I think here's what's happening, God is doing something really special in our church, and our church is rising to new levels. Others are coming against that, and they're trying to tear it down. Never in a million years would I have dreamed that it would be people inside the church trying to tear down the church. Which is why I've said this. I said this last week, and I say this all the time. If this isn't a church for you, Find one that is, because there's some really good churches. I love our brothers and sisters to the left. I love our brothers and sisters to the right. I love our brothers and sisters uh, east of us, and I love them to the west. There's some great churches. Plug into one. When God raises you up, others will try to tear you down and when it comes from people whom you love people whom you've known people sometimes family members people whom you trust it 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 hurts and if I'm honest it can begin to consume you and eat away at you somewhat like cancer and I love what Proverbs chapter 29 verse 25 says it says it is dangerous to be concerned with what others think of you it's dangerous to be concerned with what others think But if you trust the Lord, what matters most is what he thinks. Can I get an amen for that? What matters most, it isn't what the rest of the world thinks of us. It's what Jesus himself thinks. It's what Jesus himself says. In fact, someone once wrote this. The quickest way to forget how God thinks about you is to worry about what others are thinking about you and I don't want that in my life anymore because it shouldn't matter what others think as long as I'm honoring God these other leaders came against Daniel and they wanted to bring him down but Daniel didn't care what they thought verse 6 so the administrators and the high officers went to the king and said long live King Darius We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, governors, that the king should make a law that will strictly be enforced. Give orders for the next 30 days that any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except for you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, 
issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. I don't know if you catch this, but they went after his pride. They went after his ego. They boosted him up and said, look, king, you're the king. No one should worship anyone but you. You're the king. No one should be able to pray to anyone but you. And they began to build his ego. And I don't know if you know this, but there's something wrong when we allow our egos to, egos to be built up. It's the reason that Satan was cast out of heaven was his ego, his pride. And that's what they played to. And if you want to get somebody on your side, what do we do? We go and we build them up. We build up their pride. We tell them how good they are. And, and we get them on our side, right? So that now we can attack. And this brings me to the next point. Our faith makes us a target. The reason, the whole reason that Daniel was a, a target was, was his devotion to God. Because that's the whole reason he had been elevated, the reason he was anything was because of his relationship with God, his devotion, his faithfulness to God. His faith made him the target. It's the only thing that they could find to charge, to go after Daniel with. So my question this morning is simply this. If Christianity became a crime, if someone was to go after you because of their faith, what would they find? Would they be able to convict you? Would they even make an issue of it? What would they find? Our faith, like when we're fully devoted to God, our faith is what makes us a target. It's not us. And this was the only thing that they had against Daniel, verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home, he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him of the law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. That decision stands. It is an official law of Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to God three times a day. Now, I think it's important that you recognize Daniel remained faithful. When the law changed, he didn't go out. He didn't try starting a bunch of riots. He didn't go out and cause a lot of destruction. You know what Daniel did? And we can learn a lot about this. Daniel dropped down on his knees and prayed. Now, I don't know why we're changing our thoughts in our country and in our nation, why we've given up so easily on prayer that we think the only way to make change is through destruction, but that is exactly what the enemy wants you to believe. We need to begin dropping down on our knees and praying. This really was a direct attack on Daniel. He had every right to protest. He had every right to go out and stir up division, but instead, he remained faithful. He remained faithful and he fell down on his knees and he prayed. He did as he always did. I think one of the things that we need to do as a church is do what we know works and that's pray. We need to pray for one another. We need to love one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to lift one another up and not get caught up into this uh, mess that we find our country into. I love this because Daniel's devotion to God was not based on, on circumstances. He wasn't faithful only when times were good, he was faithful in good times. He was faithful in bad times. Now, some of you, again, might be saying, Pastor, that's good, but that's Old Testament. So I always like to bring in New Testament whenever there's a point that I just want to drive home. 
And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says this, I urge, and I, and I get it. Pastor, you got to read it in context. I'm the one that tells you guys this, so read it in context. Go back home and read this. I urge then, first of all, that the petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all, who, what people? All people. We should be praying for one another. We should be petitioning. We should be interceding. We should be thanking God for one another. He goes on to say, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. We've talked about this a couple times throughout this series, that if we just love God and love each other, everything else changes. That's my prayer. That's my prayer, that we can love God and love each other. And I'm not just talking about loving those inside these four walls. I'm talking about loving our country and our nation, loving people who are far away, loving each other. Love God, love one another. If we can do that, it changes everything. I believe Daniel loved. I believe he loved the king. I believe, I believe that he loved the other leaders that were persecuting him. I believe he loved the people that he was leading. I believe that's what made him so effective as a leader. Verse 14, hearing this, the king was, was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders to Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. Somewhere around the age of 82, the king said to him, May your God, whom you serve, so faithfully rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. Then the king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to his palace and he spent the night, and I find this very interesting, fasting. I don't know if you know this church, but fasting is not something that was ever intended to be done once per year. I know we open up every year with a 21-day fast or a 10-day fast, but fasting was never done, meant to be done once a year. Fasting is something that we do throughout our lives, throughout the year, throughout the month. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's, it's daily. Maybe for some of you, it's weekly. Maybe for some of you, it's monthly. But I'm telling you that if we want to be who God has called us to be, then we need to be a praying church and we need to be a fasting church church the king returned to his palace and he spent the night fasting he refused his usual entertainment and he couldn't sleep at all that night which brings me to the next point our life predicaments provide a platform for God's power to be displayed Someone needs to hear that. You might be going through some stuff and let it be a platform for God's power to be displayed in your life. What God is doing in your life through you. Very early the next morning, the king got up and he hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you faithfully served able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he trusted in 
his God. I can't tell you how exciting this story is because some of you, some of you, you've been going through some things. Some of you might find yourself in some sort of den right now. Some of you have have just been thrown into a pit and it's as if no one cares and you feel like the whole world is is crashing around you. And I want you to hear this. The same God who delivered Daniel can and will deliver you. And I'm asking that as a church that we don't turn to do things the way the rest of the world does, but instead we do things the way that we see some of the great leaders throughout scripture do, and that is remain faithful to God. And I get it. Psalm 30, verse five, and this is the second part of that verse, it says, weeping may last through the night. There might be some pain that's taking place, but joy comes. Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. I wanna invite our worship team to come back up And as they're coming back up, I want to share some parallels that I think are very interesting between Daniel and and Jesus. These are some some things that I just found very interesting as as I was studying. Maybe you already know this, but but and I knew some of these, but but didn't know all of these. Both Daniel and Jesus were both clothed in purple. That's Daniel chapter 5, verse 29, and John 19. Two. Both of them, both Daniel and Jesus, were conspired against. Both of them were innocent and, and sentenced to death. Both of them trusted in God and, and did not defend themselves. And both of them were thrown in and, and sealed <coughs> with a stone. As we close out this series... I believe that far too many of us have had our joy stolen. I'm convinced that we've been under attack and our joy has been stolen. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for you today and then we're going to worship and and, and invite that joy, the, the joy that comes in the morning, the joy that that comes from the Lord. I want to pray for you and then I want to encourage you to stand and invite that joy back into your lives. Remember, it's not based on circumstances. It's based on who God is and and who God says we are. So I'm going to ask that you bow your heads and I know we have several people watching. I'm so thankful. I, I was online earlier just checking in to see and it looked like we had about 30 families. Uh, 30 families is, 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 is easily 100 people. Thank you for watching. I want to invite you and your family to bow your heads as well. And here's the question. If you want joy back in your life, If you feel like your joy has been stolen and you want joy brought back into your life, I want to ask you to raise your hand because I want to pray for you. Some of us are fine being miserable. And that's okay. If you want to be miserable, that's between you and the Lord. But if you want joy brought back into your life, I want to encourage you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. In fact, I want to ask the worship team if they'll just join me. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that the joy of the Lord is your strength. We're going to pray that that this week's a little different than last week. This week's a little different than this summer. This week's a little different than this past spring. That 2020 ends well because of the joy of the Lord. Heavenly Father, you see every hand that's lifted. Lord, they're asking for it your joy. We're praying for your joy. We know that it's unspeakable and full of glory. We believe in your joy. We're asking right now, Holy Spirit, to rise up in every believer to comfort, to restore that joy, to make new again, to bring on a new excitement. May our lives be changed right now. I pray for those on on our screen that are watching us live today that you would just specifically 
conquer all strongholds and replace those with joy that they're rising up I pray for those who have been living in fear that that fear be replaced with joy and that we're finishing this year well and we thank you we thank you for your joy in Jesus name everyone said amen would you give God a hand this morning I thank you I thank you for being here.